Do, 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 do. All right. You should see a record light here. Yeah. Yep. Everybody got the record light? Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Greetings, Doom fans and other diners and just interesting in flat. Welcome to another edition of the Collapse Cafe of the Doomstead Diner. And uh, starting off this broadcast again, begging for money. Okay. Month of June, the diner bills have come due. Please go to the diner donate button. On the blog home page, okay, over there to donate. I don't know if you can see it, but you know, just go to the home page. It's uh, doomsaidiner.net slash blog, okay. Uh, and uh, or and or use smile.amazon.com website uh, to buy your stuff and designate the Sustaining Universal Needs Foundation as your uh, charity, okay? 501c3, tax deductible, etc. And you don't pay anything extra. Jeff Bezos makes the donation. He takes the deductible. <laughs> uh, all right, so that's enough begging. Uh, and uh, uh, today's topic, uh, a little bit more upbeat than uh, a couple of our past episodes have been. You know, coronavirus and racial politics and whatnot. You know, uh, a lot of strife out there, he says. Uh, but that's uh, the nature of us. So, uh, but today we're talking about positive steps that you might take to uh, ensure your own personal resilience uh, in the face of collapse. And uh, the specific topic we're going to start with is electricity uh, and uh, electrical resilience. Uh, but we probably won't stop there because uh, my guests have other interests as well. Permaculture, uh, particularly, is of great interest uh, here. And also uh, building structures and whatnot. Uh, one of our one of the participants has just bought himself a new house uh, and uh, whatnot. We might talk a little bit about the housing stuff. And uh, so, just uh, let me introduce the people uh, I've got with me, uh, Lucid Dreams, who is uh, the person who uh, was uh, going to uh, build a house. He's a former naval nuclear engineer and uh, currently over the road trucker, uh, following my footsteps, <laughs> uh, and his father's uh, also. Uh, a lot of truckers around here, and maybe we'll talk some about trucking in the future. Uh, and uh, uh, he's uh, one person. Then we have uh, K Dog, uh, who's uh, another one of the diner admins, runs his own uh, blog, Chasing the Squirrel, uh, a very uh, interested collapse neck, and very active uh, in terms of trying to inform people and uh, wake people up to uh, what's going on. And uh, he's uh, an engineer uh, and also a, uh, an electrical hobbyist. Uh, he builds his own electric bike uh, and uh, really knows a good deal about that subject too. Uh, so uh, he uh, hopefully will have some interesting tidbits to throw in. And then finally, our youngest uh, participant today uh, is Cam. Uh, is another uh, person from Ontario, Canada, uh, and he uh, uh, is a recent college graduate and has decided to take a different route in uh, in his future career uh, and go into the trades. Uh, and specifically, he's interested in going into uh, the electrical trade uh, as an electrician. So. Uh, he uh, probably will have some things uh, to ask and questions to ask and some things to you know, put in, uh, input on his, uh, what's going on around his place. And then finally, our, uh, uh, my, my 
regular guest these days. Uh, I've had him on for, I think, three. Uh, this is the third uh, episode that uh, I'm doing with uh, Irv Mills. Uh, he uh, is a recently retired uh, electrician for uh, Ontario Hydro, which is uh, the power authority that's uh, sort of responsible for uh, that province. He uh, worked on both uh, with the nuclear uh, plants and the hydro plants that supply uh, electricity to Ontario. Uh, and, uh, you know, he wasn't working inside the plants. He was working on the transformers and stuff like that. Uh, and he can fill you in on that. You, you probably, if you watch our first episode, you know, you know that history. Uh, so, uh, and then there's me. Okay. Uh, and I'm, a, you know, collapse Nick and, uh, uh, prepper, and, and uh, uh, I have uh, a lot of uh, uh, systems, backup systems, uh, that uh, I will talk about uh, as things progress. But I'm going to let uh, I'm going to let Irv start it off, and uh, what do you call it? Uh, you want to uh, kick it off here, Irv, and uh, tell us what yeah. uh, what do you think about uh, electricity and collapse? Okay, yeah, well, hello, everyone. And uh, what I can tell you from uh, a career, 30 year, 31 years working in the, uh, in the grid, is that a power grid is a uh, complex and fragile thing. Uh, they're exposed to a lot of stress from weather and potentially very uh, exposed to acts of sabotage. Um, a lot of maintenance is required, and uh, there's a trade-off between short-run profit for the company running a grid and, uh, and long-term reliability. And in addition to this, the sources of energy to, uh, to drive electrical generation um, are becoming more and more problematical. So uh, I would say in the short run, the next few years, uh, we're going to start to see a lot more uh, outages uh, they're going to become more frequent and last longer, uh, and uh, they're also going to involve larger areas of the grid. And then in the long run, down the road, uh, I won't even predempt, per, attempt to predict how far, but uh, it's, it'll get to the point where it's not really feasible to run a power grid. And uh, one by one, they'll split up into smaller areas, and many will shut down altogether. So. That's not a very positive uh, outlook, especially since electrical power is, is very useful. And it, it come down to uh, things like lighting, refrigeration, pumping water, uh, powering tools for localized manufacturing. Um, it sure would be nice to have some electricity if it isn't, even if it isn't available from the grid. Uh, so what can be done? Well, uh, I think you will turn to local distributed generation uh, using various uh, renewable sources of power like uh, falling water, the wind, the sun, and burning biomass. Uh, and where such power sources are readily available, I, I, people will build small scale systems for turning them into electricity distributing it locally and uh, storing it if, in the cases where the sources are intermittent. Um, and to make that work, you got to focus on uh, reducing your needs for power to match the limited uh, amount that you can generate and uh, only using electricity where it's clearly the best choice. Uh, and in the short run, of course, it's pretty easy to... Uh, to set up systems using high-tech things like solar cells and inverters and batteries. Uh, further down the road, those will break down and, and, and be repaired and then eventually uh, have to be replaced with less high-tech things. And uh, anyways, even at the present, 
for those of us who are not eager to get off the grid right away, uh, some form of backup power to uh, sustain us through outages is a, a mighty handy thing. Uh, you know, I have a, a deep freeze down the basement full of meat, and uh, if there's a two or three day outage, I don't want it to spoil. So personally, I've got a, uh, nothing more complex than a generator and a few cans full of gasoline to, uh, to be able to run it. Anyways, um, I, at this point, I've talked enough. Uh, you got to watch uh -huh. me. I tend to, to run yeah. on. Well, but, uh, I, I, see, I can see you. Oh, yeah, I can jump into anything. A prepared statement uh, there, you know, notes. So I just let you go without uh, asking any questions. Uh, yeah, well, as, thanks. I'm interested in, and I tried to get this question in earlier to Keith, who was having some technical difficulties, uh, about the fragility of uh, our grid and its uh, susceptibility to sabotage and the various types of sabotage that can occur, uh, specifically uh, computer generated sabotage because uh, the, the electrical grid is run uh, across uh, the net. Uh, that's the way uh, it, it, it's good communication happens. And in fact, one of the biggest power outages on the East Coast you know, it started up in, uh, I think, started in Ontario, and then everything went down after. Uh, so you really just have to hit one node uh, in a very large grid, and you can take down the whole grid. Keith, you want to talk about uh, this, that that possibility, susceptibility, uh, of course? I'm not terribly knowledgeable on the power side of things. You know, I come from more of the instrumentation side, you know, transistors and little stuff that goes into com radios and computers, all that, you know, and, you know, high voltage for tubes and, but raw power, raw machines, you know, I, I know the basics and I'm a double E, so there is an interest in, you know, a meeting Irv here comes from kind of the other side of things and we sort of mean the middle sort of thing. So we can understand each other, but we have different backgrounds. So. Uh -huh. But so I'll, I'll just talk about what I, I know about the grid myself, and maybe Erd can pipe in if he feels the need to. Uh, it is fragile, you know. It um, one thing can bring it down, and then there's a cascading failure that goes over the over the whole thing. So from that point of view, you know, you, yeah, you got to worry about sabotage and making it more robust and all that. Um, but, you know, the big thing is what it is. Uh, and all it is, it's transmitting power. It's nothing magical here. And, you know, a few years ago, people started talking about this smart grid. You know, what the hell is a smart grid? You know, it's about, come on, it's, it's hype. And, uh, you know, such thing, you know. Um, yeah, what I think I figured out where it came from. One of the things that we need to do with any renewable energy is storage is always an issue. So you want a smart grid compared to the old dumb grid that's smart enough to switch things on and switch things out and take care of all these balancing things, which involves computers and, uh, and uh, technology that say in the 1940s when you were able to distribute power just fine, you didn't need. So from that point of view, you know, human nature's always uh, making things more complex. You know, we never stop where we should. We never assess, do we need to do this or maybe we should go this way instead? No, that's not how our culture works. Maybe other things are possible. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, that, that's what I got to say about the smart grid. You know, it's when we're talking electricity, there is no such thing as electric power. Electricity transfers power from a source from one thing to another, from falling water, nuclear, wind, and where is it coming from? Do we have enough of it? We don't for the number of people we have. And, and what are we going to do? You know, and a lot of what, when the public cares to deal with these issues at all, I'm realizing, you know, just how much fluff, you know, in particular, the, the movie, you know, Planet of the Humans came out, which I've got on my website. 
you can watch it. It actually is. I've got Michael Moore's website in an iframe if you want to go there. And it's you know it, it talks about alternative energies and the green revolution and basically well, what is going to come down to if humanity wants to go forward and, and live, we got to uh, reduce our numbers and we got to reduce our consumption. And in terms of you know a person generating their own power, if you can do it do it that's great and i i'm you know i'm, I'm a nerd and I'll, I'll talk about such things and i'd love to be able to do that myself but i live in the seattle suburbs my, my neighbors are not going to be too happy if i if i put a hundred foot tower in a with a 20 foot you know rotor on it to catch the little bit when we have when we have it which we don't have very much of so there's no know, i'm pretty much stuck where i am so no rainwater water yes. in your area and in terms of the acreage that you have on the plot where your house is uh you could not grow uh, even as fast as it grows you couldn't grow enough bamboo uh to uh, power your house uh, that's not true light an led what you know it's, it's about all it depends on how, how much power you're using okay and if you you know seriously reduce the, the amount of power and you know everybody should basically look at their uh, electric bill, okay, and uh, and that will tell you how a power consumptive you are. Uh, you know, myself, uh, I live in Alaska, and I'm getting a combined gas and electric bill uh, from uh, the uh, electric uh, Montanusco Electric Association, uh, which is our cooperative uh, in the uh, 1930s uh, when FDR was. Uh, uh, doing a lot of that stuff, you know, building things and uh, Hoover Dam was built uh, and so forth, all public work stuff uh, to uh, get people working in the Great Depression. So uh, uh, my bill, I pay uh, about $40 a month all together uh, from my gas and electric uh, and so forth and uh, and that is just Plenty, okay, for me. Uh, but another thing I don't need, I live in Alaska, is air conditioning, which is one of the most power consumptive things that you can uh, possibly use, uh, but is uh, uh, ubiquitous uh, in the lower 48 and then uh, necessary for life uh, once you get into the uh, you know, tropical latitude. I mean, you just you can't live in Florida or Houston. Uh, and so forth. And those aren't even tropical, they're subtropical. Uh, in the summertime, <laughs> without air conditioning, you'll die. Uh, and uh, so, but, you know, for one of the electrical people, like our friend Cam here, uh, HVAC, uh, high voltage air conditioning is uh, uh, a, a important thing. And, and uh, you know, have you, uh, have you had, I know you're experimenting with welding now. Cam, have you done anything with uh, 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 air conditioning or refrigeration? Mm, no, not that I can really think of. Like I played around with an old, uh, my dad had like a solar battery charger laying around in the garage that he never used. I guess it didn't work or something. So I pulled the little plug off. This was a few months ago. And I was just experimenting with my multimeter, like different angles and different times of day, how much power I'd get. But that's all I've really experimented with. Nothing with heating or cooling so far. Uh -huh. Well, I, I built a little rocket stove, but that's more just, that's just kind of for fun. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, you, uh, you know, you, you, you pick it up a little bit at a time. You know, one thing a lot of people don't necessarily realize is that what the electricity is doing to run your fridge it, it isn't cooling it directly. It runs a pump, okay? And the pump pumps a refrigerant, uh, which uses, you know, a, a, a thermodynamic principle called adiabatic uh, thermal expansion. Uh, and uh, you can put that in your memory. Uh, and uh, for a long time, they used fluorocarbons, fluorocarbons uh, for that purpose uh, but then they found that they once they get up into the ozone they destroy the ozone and so forth and so they changed refrigerants uh over the years 
but essentially, anything you can make turn a pump will provide refrigeration as long as you have uh, a liquid that you can compress and then it can. Uh, KRE, do you know where uh, the big when refrigeration, a big technically a technical advancement was during the American Civil War when the South couldn't get ice and it stimulated a lot of technical I think there were prizes offered and I don't know the details but I just thought I'd throw that in there that you know conventional refrigeration yeah it actually has been around that long and um, a carrier company uh, the, ma the man who founded it he he was a you know a very important part of American history actually because he was able to put refrigeration on trucks and that was a big thing and uh you know all these things led to the way we live yeah, but i just I, thought i'd throw that in there and interrupt in the, you in the trucking industry those those uh mobile units are known as reefers uh and uh i got a big part of the industry that pulls uh refrigerated uh trailers i pulled a few refrigerated trailers but uh, mostly i did what they call dry box uh which is uh you know all of goods most of the goods that you buy you know and a lot of beer a lot of paper toilet paper uh <laughs> the toilet paper ran out up here recently but uh we have not yet uh, had a shortage of beer thank you. uh and uh so uh but that's you know a tangent uh and and now we're talking about the local end of things uh I'd like to go around the uh, uh, the group here and ask what you see in terms of solar installations. All right, now you've got a lot of people, especially the upper middle class to rich, who can afford these things, uh, uh, installing these you know fairly elaborate solar arrays on their roofs. You know, and then you have uh, I don't know, it's probably Elon Musk rack. <laughs> uh, who, uh, you know, kind of envisions a solar roof on every house in America and uh, and, and his power wall batteries uh, charging up from them and whatever. Uh, uh, just ridiculous things that just aren't going to happen. Uh, but, but rich people are doing it. Uh, and so I'm interested if you go around your area, uh, where and how often do you actually spy uh, somebody with solar array uh, in your neighborhood. Uh, I'll start with uh, 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 start with Earth. Okay. Earth. Okay. Yeah. Well, if I look out my uh, my back window here, the the guy back of me has uh, a bunch of solar cells on the roof of his house, and I'm sure he's got a deal where he's uh, it's hooked up to the grid and when he's got excess power he's feeding back into the grid and when he doesn't anyways and if you drive around the countryside I live in a little town of about uh, probably 7,000 people in the middle of a, a rural area lots of farming done here and uh, there are uh, lots of farm buildings with cells on the roofs there are uh, lots of the setups where there's a I don't know maybe 20 feet by 20 feet on a thing that tracks the sun uh so yeah it's over the last few years a lot of them has sprung up and i know the uh hydro one the, the successor to uh ontario hydro uh, was offering some pretty good uh deals to anybody wanting to put up solar cells uh but more than solar Around here, what you'll notice is wind farms. There are a, a, there's quite a, we're right on Lake Huron here, and there's a, some pretty good winds come in off the lake, and so there's a lot of uh, big wind turbines. Uh, and, and Sam, what about your neighborhood? Uh, you know, I don't know how close you are to Earth, but. Uh, uh, I think it's further south, closer to Toronto, probably. But uh, yeah, well, I'm uh, I'm up in northern Ontario, and the neighborhood I'm in is definitely like in in my city. It's like the the, the higher class neighborhood, and I think if I go around 
mine, like close to my house on like a bike ride, I, there's one house that's got uh, uh, solar panels on the roof. But if I go like further out, we're kind of on the edge of the city too. So if I go for a long bike ride, like 10 kilometers, out, it's not that long, but 10 kilometers out, uh, we're kind of into like the more rural outskirts part of town. And then I see a whole lot more uh, solar setups. And I, I love going through there, like not, not being creepy and staring at people's houses, but just going through and kind of looking, seeing the setups they have. Because, yeah, so not not really in my neighborhood, but when you go into the outskirts of the city and the more rural parts, I see a lot more. Yeah, and uh, uh, Aaron, what about uh, uh, around here? Now you're you're south. You're down in South Carolina, so uh, yet uh, uh, the sun comes in at a, 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 a better angle, so you're going to get more energy uh, per square foot on your, uh, on your solar panel. Uh, uh, do you see much uh, going on there in in the neighborhoods? And plus, you drive uh, the truck. So you see a lot of other places that go around. You, you, wh what have you been seeing in terms of solar uh, installations? Uh, well, as far as locally where I'm at, um, you know, it's, I mean, you, 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 you've got solar companies calling to offering to put solar panels on your roof, uh, you know, kind of thing. And then you just pay them for power. Um, and then, and it's, you know, a small percentage. I mean, you see them. Um, when I was in the market looking for houses, um, I actually found one that uh, had solar panels already. Well, I found two actually. You know, my price range that had solar panels on the roof, uh, and you had to like, you, you know, you had to basically take over the contract when you bought the house with the company that installed the solar panels because it's, it's not like you don't buy the solar panels and own them from those companies. You you know, they put them on the roof and then you pay them for power instead of paying for, you know, the alternative to, for the main source of power, you know, which here we have nuclear, hydroelectric, um, uh, probably have some, uh, some coal burning plants. I mean, so, you know, it's like everywhere yeah. else. But as far as like what I see, you know, driving around the country, uh, you know, I, I pretty much stay east of I-35, so, you know, which basically bisects Texas, so everything east of, of the middle of Texas, that's kind of my stomping ground, and, uh, you know, I, but I'm usually, well, mostly I'm on the interstates, you know, but a lot of times, you know, I'm on uh, highways, like, two, you know, two-lane highways, country roads occasionally, uh, and I don't ever see solar panels, hardly ever. But, w you know, what I do see a lot of is, is uh, well, especially, uh, you know, in Indiana, um, is uh, they, there's a huge solar farm, sorry, a, a wind farm on I-65, which is probably 60 miles north of Indianapolis, something like that, 70 miles, something like that. And you can't miss it on I-65. It's, you know. Right, yeah. Probably no, thousands probably or hundreds of windmills. Uh, probably a 20-mile stretch of just wind windmills, like huge, you know, wind turbines. Yeah, yeah, the big um, ones. Yeah, yeah so, you see you know, things in California uh, driving a truck when you're, you're coming coming down off the mountain. Uh you, uh, they, they've got them all up there, you know, hundreds, hundreds of these big, big suckers, uh, turning. And, uh, there, there are all sorts of problems with those things, uh, that they have, uh, come up with o over the years. Uh, Keith, what about around, uh, Seattle area? Well, I like the way you introduced this. We talk about the rich people having them because that's pretty much what you're going to see around here. And I reached over on my bookshelf and I pulled out this thing here. You see? 1983, it's out. Energy. Yeah, what does it say? Well, what's the title? Read it. Read it. Energy Engineering Fundamentals with Residential and Commercial Applications. Written in 1983, before the Republican takeover of America, when actually people cared about these things for a brief period of time. But <laughs> anyway, in here, 
is a map. And this map shows how much, you know, um, light you're going to get at a, a particular latitude. You know, kind of it, it, it tells you how efficient your application is going to be. And, you know, Seattle's not so good. It's kind of funny we're talking about this because we've got two Canadians. We got a Seattleite and we got a guy in Alaska. We're kind of um, a little bit north of where solar power is really useful. You know, I'm not saying it's not useful. I'm, I got my angle here. And my angle, again, is getting back to how much are we getting out of it? How efficient is it? And, you know, around here, we do have hydro and we've had low, low electric rates relative to the rest of the country. And we're in an area where we have a lot of clouds. And at there are times when yeah. we might have a month, I mean, we, you know, when, when we have a, our insulation's down to 5%, you're not going to get very much electricity out of your solar panel, even at noon. So, you know, it's useful. If I had um, another issue I have in Seattle is trees. Uh, that, that we call them weeds. Uh, but, you know, we have Douglas firs that, that will grow over 100 feet high in your lifetime, no problem. And trying to find uh, in, uh, enough, an area that's not going to be obfuscated by, you know, something during the day is, is difficult. So. Is uh, Douglas fir uh, uh, much different from spruce? As far as the quality they, of the wood? Uh, yeah, they are. They, they, I, I've contemplated the difference myself and they don't they're not the same uh they're they're a fur of some kind they're kind of by them i just ask because uh I'm, I'm thinking specifically of hoover culture i know spruce uh you know sep holzer and it is is pretty much the, the grandfather of hoover culture and he's uh from austria and that whole thing started because he had a whole bunch of spruce trees and uh they're pretty much good for nothing uh, except for building soil so I was just wondering yeah. with Douglas fir if it was kind of a, a similar, I don't know a whole lot about trees, um, but uh, I just wanted to ask you, you know, what what's well, the difference? When I, I say they're, they're weeds, I'm joking. I mean, because they grow so fast and so big around here, but they're actually a very useful tree and they make very good lumber. So um, oh, okay. they're, they're, yeah. they're great, you know, it's a well, beautiful place to live. That's a good thing for energy. I mean, yeah. something... Well, you know, you, you can't have a forest grow for 20 years, cut it down just to, you know, watch YouTube videos and cats, you know, on, on YouTube. I mean, come on. I mean, uh, how much land do we have and what, how much can we use can we get out of it? Yeah, I mean, Planet of the Humans, you know, they're showing, you know, um, yucca trees being ripped apart so for solar farms and... Um, you know, they show a forest that's level, that's going to, you know, where the trees are shipped to Germany and for a biomass plant. And, you know, how much, I do believe that biomass, yeah, there are certain kinds that's a best use, you know, we, we got some scrap. You know, I, I once saw a, uh, years a year ago, I saw a little documentary about a uh, Swedish furniture making plant. And they were generating all their power needs from their sawdust. You know, and that's great. And we should do that kind of stuff wherever we can. But, you know, how many solar panels do I see? Well, I'll never see enough to give us the power we need. So, well, and that's, that's, the, that, that's the point I'm making here, right? I mean, if you want to talk about sustainability, I mean, solar panels are, that's a high tech thing. It requires, uh, it requires infrastructure. I mean, you can't you can't make a solar panel at home with materials that you can readily grow. It requires industry and energy to produce. Never mind maintain. I mean, just even just the lines taking it where it's going. I mean, which you can't with solar. You really can't even you you really can't even transmit solar far because no, it's low voltage. You have to yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it has to be local. 
But what I'm saying is it's not it, it's not really no matter how good we get at capturing sun energy and turning it into electricity that we can capture from a plug with an appliance, it's never going to be something that's going to power industry or civilization. It's only ever going to be local. So what's more important, in my opinion, is figuring out how to capture sun in- solar energy with biological plant like energy like that that's what like grass i mean that's what it does it captures solar energy and turns it into something that we can then use you know we can we can move it around like just even just grass yeah why you know here's a real stupidity why cut down a forest a whole bunch of trees to put up either windmills or solar panels if you just let the forest grow and periodically cut the trees you can get more energy out of that than you'll ever get out of a wind farm or a solar uh, array farm on the same location because well, the, the big farms are, that you're talking about perfect. i got an answer to that the big farms you're talking about are not they don't come from local initiative those those you know those are done by big corporations and you know think about some boardroom in new york oh let's clear off a mountaintop and put up a a a wind farm you know there is that's one of the things you know that being a diner i've come to appreciate ever more as time goes by that the the future a, a viable future is based on localism and transparency and Throw in what else you want there. I think those two are really important. So I'll stop with those two. Uh-huh. So, yeah, and uh, I, I, agree. You know, and, I agree with you completely, Keith. Uh-huh. And I guess what I was going to say is, uh, from a, a viewpoint of a, a guy who knows something about running a grid, a little bit anyway, uh, things like I- intermittent power sources, like solar and uh, and wind are a real pain in the butt to hook up to a grid. If you're operating a grid, you want something that when the load goes up, you can turn your generation up. And when the load goes down, you can turn it down. Well, solar and wind are just the opposite. They go up and down when they want to. And likely at the least inopportune moment. So it makes it pretty challenging to uh, to run a grid if that they're going to be a significant percentage of the power source. Yeah, and that's yeah, well, you got our smart grid was made up. Yeah, you got to use try. You got to cope with that. Batteries. You, you have to have batteries if you're going to well, if you're going to use that on, on a reliable twenty four hour basis. But you have to have a way to need lithium. Some of that energy. <laughs> exactly, well, which is a rare. I mean, it's 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 what unsustainable. Made Bolivia. Uh, well, the I, amount I, of go ahead, go ahead, finish, finish off. You had you had something you want to finish? No, let me move. Well, on. What I what, what I was just going to say is batteries are great, but it's a matter of scale and the size of a battery you need, uh, even just to, to to carry a province like Ontario through the night till the sun comes up again, is huge and bizarre. You, and it, as you're saying. There maybe isn't enough lithium available in the whole, on the whole planet to to supply batteries on the scale that we need if we were going to use wind and solar as our major sources. There, I, I'm saying you would have to have a battery, huge battery bank, to make that work for civilization. That's my point, and you can't yeah. have that. That, that, that yeah, doesn't. That's even, yeah, if, even, even if you conceivably could. Even if you conceivably could create these huge battery farms, which is what they would have to be, you wouldn't have the the rare earth metals in the. I mean, to make that even happen, or uh, or, or, or never mind the infrastructure, like how you're going to move those things around, how you're going to maintain them. I mean, that you know, I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, really. Here, I mean, here's one to throw out at you guys because this is a, a, a concept that I came up with. Uh, a, a, a simple way uh, to store power 
when you're getting too much and then get it back later, which is to set up a uh, basically a tower, okay, and a very large weight, say two tons, okay, uh, and then when the power is coming in, it cranks the weight up the tower, okay, and then when the power is not coming in, the weight drops down slowly and turns flywheel that turns a generator it makes that's later. another re that, that's just another re rat trap yeah but it's a very simple way <laughs> to do it that's not going to power civilization re you, you, you can't yeah, uh, but you know done done over and over again it, you know if you had you know them in every community you know dozens of them of these towers uh and that they're all lifting uh, when they get get the solar power or whatever or the wind, and and then if you're using wind power, it doesn't even have to be transferred through electricity. That can be done mechanically. All right, uh, so we can do the cranking yeah, mechanically. Not, so how big a weight and how far would it have to drop to get your butt from where you are over to the three bears and back? Uh, it wouldn't be very big. That that wouldn't be oh, very well. I think we're going to be big. big. I think we're oh, yeah. tons of we could run a mile or so. That you could run a turbine with, on the way down. You could spin a turbine and create electricity that way. But I mean, it's not. It's just like I said. It's just another one of RE's rat traps. Yeah, he's well, got thousands of them. <laughs> You've got thousands from my thousands. Uh, uh, my uh, there's no end to RE's rat trap inventions. Are you finished? I'm done. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Move on. Please continue, from, sir. From from Wu Goldberg uh, to a more often used type of battery, and what it, its applications are, and that's this. Okay, this is what's known as an SLA, uh, sealed lead acid battery, uh, and this is a, a 10 amp hour one. Okay, uh, and these these are the batteries. Or I call them bats. Uh, these are the bats that run my cripple carts, okay? Uh, which are what I call them. Uh, they're electric scooters. Electric. I have a, a three-wheel electric scooter. Uh, I have a, a electric wheelchair, uh, and I have a two-wheel electric scooter. I have three of them, and uh, any one of those will get me to the grocery store and back. Okay, which is a total total trip in that is about a mile, and uh, and two of these will run my 24 volt uh, scooter, and uh, they cost about 24 dollars each, and they last. This one finally uh, was not useful in the cripple cart anymore uh, after about two years, uh, which is one holding enough charge, but it still it still works. Okay. Uh, and I use it as one of my backup powers uh, uh, sources. Uh, and I have numerous of them because I have th three crypt charts, right? One of them takes three of these, another one takes two, and the other one, two bigger ones, big, big bats. It's, it's a so pack. how many mice in a cage would have to run for how long to charge up one of those things? <laughs> uh, I don't know how many, I don't know how many mice would have to to do it, but I do, know, I do know that if you have one five watt power uh, source, uh, uh, say it's solar power, that you could charge it up in about uh, what do you call it? A day, okay. Uh, and uh, and it doesn't no, take much. You're only going to get a hundred watts in a day at five watts, and tw well, a five times twenty. Yeah, it's a hundred watts a day, and that's. Well, they're, they're, well what if you had a million mice? They're though? not twenty-four; they're twelve. Oh, right, you need a million mice. Yeah, all right. Only take and, yeah. Yeah. They <laughs> breathe really <laughs> quickly. Mice. Okay, and the, and the fact of the matter is that you can do it with a small generator. You don't need the fucking mice. Okay, and you can run the generator off of wood gas. All right, which is renewable, and you can get or the wood bamboo gas. You can, you can get can the wood bamboo. 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 All right, so. You, you know, did someone say bamboo? Generating enough electric power to power up <laughs> these things is not going to any time too soon. All right. Uh, and besides that, 
all right, especially with the people who are putting up these uh, uh, solar, their own solar systems. For Can we turn bamboo into oh. plastic? What? Plastic? Turn bamboo into plastic? Because if we can turn bamboo into plastic, then we can make the black plastic cases that make your batteries. Because I don't know where they're going to come from. You know, you hold up right. that battery. Mm -hmm. You don't need to put batteries in a black plastic case. There's a lot you of other things. You can actually do with bamboo carpet. Uh, there's a lot of other things you can make a battery out of. Uh, bamboo, carpet. You can make a battery out of it. Good container. Perfect, yeah. No, you can actually make a battery out of bamboo charcoal. Battery. So it creates a, a current. Bamboo charcoal. I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Uh, yeah. So the thing is, and Herb mentioned it charcoal earlier. Charcoal made out of bamboo. That's what that, I'm talking about. Is that uh, electricity is not likely to completely disappear on us anytime too soon. What you will see, in all likelihood, and this is happening around the world as we go, we speak now, uh, are brownouts and rolling blackouts, okay, uh, where uh, periods of time go during the day where the electricity is off, and then you'll get it for a few hours, and then it'll be moved to the next neighborhood, and that's a rolling blackout, okay, and it's a way yeah, to- I've got a question about that. Yeah, for, for Irv here, uh, Come here. rolling blackouts, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, the beginning of this, that there'd be more of those in the future. And why would that, where are they, what's the reason for those? I think I know the answer, but I want you to say uh, something. About usually, uh, in the grid I was involved with, was set up to do rolling blackouts if it happened that uh, we lost a bunch of generation and didn't have enough generation to cope with the load. So you turn, people take their turn at being turned off. One of the things I know that, that's going on in Venezuela is, you know, they've had to have be without power for a long period of times in areas and they tried to bring it back up. Yeah. And they've had huge issues where they get, they bring it up back up and it's up for ten minutes, then it's gone again. And uh, often yeah, that well, is a, a way things. But the, uh, the thing about know, a where power I'm going grid with this is I, I I see. You know I I what I see in our future is is the infrastructure breaking down and not being able to maintain it, and that's what's going to cause a lot of the future failures. It's not yeah, strictly going sure. to be a lack of energy. Yeah, yeah. Well, it. I mean, uh, all kinds of things can happen that could cause uh, a lack of, or make it difficult, for instance, to get uh, the jet, the power from where it's being generated to where it's being used. Uh, we were talking about sabotage. Uh, not too seriously, but you know, uh, in addition to messing with the control system, uh, give me a pipe wrench, and uh, I can drive out to the one of the 500,000 volt lines that runs from the, the nuclear station that I live 10 miles away from, all the way down towards the, the Toronto where most of the people in Ontario live, and if I just go to one of those big towers and undo the bolts that's holding it to the concrete footings and there's nobody around they're out in the middle of a farmer's field just undo the bolts and walk away and the next time there's a big wind down she goes you know uh so there's there's all kinds of very low-tech uh ways of sabotaging a power system and there's all kinds of low-tech people who are pissed off with the way the world is going. And and I can certainly see that uh, this could escalate from throwing uh, bricks through the windows of a Target store and setting it on fire to, uh, to people deciding to take some direct action on the power system. And, and certainly the transmission network is probably the most uh, exposed 
and the easiest to mess with. I don't want to give anybody a quick course on how to how to shut off the world, but that's <laughs> pretty easy to do. Pretty straightforward. And you know that you say that you know it can escalate to that level, uh, and it, it, it in a sense it already has in the Middle East because power transmission there is the oil pipelines. Okay. Uh, an oil pipeline is transmitting power just the same as an electric wire is transmitting power. Uh, it's just chemical energy in that case, instead of electrical energy. Uh, and, uh, and so what do the terrorists, so to speak, or, or freedom fighters, depending on oh, which side you're on, <laughs> uh, what you call them, uh, what, what are they attacking? They're attacking pipelines, all right, to stop the, the transmission of oil to take down their governments because uh, the governments are funded by, who, you you guess it, the oil industry uh, or the energy industry is because it's more comprehensive. It's a function of scale. Obviously, if you've got things localized, you're going to be more res resilient about that. Uh, so exactly. it's, it's a function of the large conglomeration of everything. Everything's always grow growing and always getting bigger. And it's always getting more fragile for that. And also because it's done, the contracts go to the lowest bidder. You know, uh, things are not built to be resilient in the first place. They're built as cheaply as possible. And so we're in a situation where we just assume that this can go on forever and that we would not be having issues of infrastructure, uh, having to worry about terrorism, which, you know, in the short term could probably be fixed with huge force, which, you know, none of us Well, wants. you can't fix terrorism. No. That's, no, that's in the minds and the hearts of the people who commit terrorism. But right. at the same time, the terrorists are not going to walk more than 50 miles from the city to undo the bolts. The, the towers that are going to fall will be within 50 miles of an interstate, you know. So some of the stuff in far north Canada probably pretty safe uh, unless you've got so well you can you can do 50 miles on a bicycle pretty quick okay uh so you don't necessarily have to have a car uh to do it but if you're doing 50 miles on a bicycle you got a road uh, not necessarily uh you ride fat tire guys up here ride fat tire bikes all the time uh in uh, out in the bush uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been spending a lot of time on Google Earth, you know, and, and yeah, like, um, Canada anyway. How do the technicians get there to service the towers? They have roads. Ontario has yeah. roads. Oh, the, the ones They're I'm talking about. Bikes. Yeah, but no, seriously, the the Ontario, at least southern Ontario where I live, not maybe so much northern Ontario where Cam lives, is uh, is not remote. There's highways and, you know, county roads and township roads. Uh, you can drive to any of these locations if you were uh, minded to to interfere with the power system. Not hard well, to do. Uh, roads are a basic requirement of civilization. Exactly. I mean, I, I mean it, it, it sounds kind of dumb to even say that. You know to this crowd but i mean that's the fact like what what are we talking about here if well, we don't have I roads looking at google uh, earth rome had roads they you know, still I'm exist looking at google earth and i i'm looking at these transmission plants in northern canada you know these these um like from the oh there's a reservoir that feeds the churchill river okay and i'm seeing that there are these power stations and they're hydroelectric and yeah. they're connected. Yeah, there's a road to them, one road. And, and uh, obviously all the traffic comes at one road. So, sort of like the single road to Prudhoe Bay kind of thing. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, terrorism would be a big problem up there. But. Well, it, it might interest you to know that. Uh, <clears throat> Racism is just about as big a problem in uh, Canada as it is in the States. Uh, we don't like to admit it. And the people that we pick on more than our blacks are our native people. We treat them 
terribly. Uh, and there's lots of uh, native reservations in northern Ontario. So, <laughs> yes, there's uh, there's some pretty big power projects up up there, and there's some pretty disgruntled people not far away. So, Irv, you you yeah. you, you may be correct, and that you treat your native people like shit, but mm -hmm. we treated our native people damn near to extinction like shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, we did the well, we, we did the same thing, but I guess what. Royal I'm Canadian saying, you, you're, you guys are nicer in Canada. You think so? No. Yeah, this is coming as a shock to me. I am, no, it's not a shock. But, uh, no, yeah. I, I, saw no, some, I, I saw some statistics on this recently. And, uh, yeah, we do treat our Native people even worse than you guys treat your Native people. And maybe oh, yeah. our Black... Anyway, yeah, it's, it, it's the system, really. I mean, it's not you personally or Cam or anyone else you know. You exactly. Know. It's, it's the, the system. system that treats them like shit. And that's the same thing going on here with the, oh, God, when we breach the be the Black Lives Matter. I mean, it's the yeah. same thing going on here. It's the system. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I a, mean, it's, it's a systemic problem. And we treated not, that. And we treated that in a prior episode, uh, which you guys haven't seen yet. I just finished the editing. But we, we I talked. guess you're going to try to contain it all. You're going to hear. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what he's going to do. Yeah, he's going to show himself to be insensitive here and get in all sorts of trouble. Yeah. Hey, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I brought, I'm sorry I brought it up. Mr. Intensity, I'm glad you brought I'm gonna, it up. You no, so the whole project. Uh, man. Getting that, tying that into what we're talking about, though. Why would people who are not, say, blowing up and knocking down the towers now, why would they suddenly start doing it? You know, where would be the organization, the motivation? That, you know, because one problem we have, you know, is, you know, our black anger, a lot of it has been directed in the black community against each other. You know, yeah, years of that by Wouldn't necessarily seem to be the most effective way. Well, you would, since you asked the question, um, I'll tell you what was going on in Canada early this year. Uh, and of course, it's been out of the news because the coronavirus has swamped the news, uh, was uh, pipelines, building new mm -hmm. pipelines uh, from the tar sands in northern Alberta across through British Columbia to the Pacific Ocean uh, through land that the natives have a, a pretty solid claim to. And uh, there was dispute over whether they were uh, agreeing to let it happen or not. And in sympathy for this, uh, natives elsewhere in Canada, you know, set up uh, roadblocks, stop traffic. Uh, our rail transport system was, uh, you know, ground to a halt because these guys were, were stopping we're setting up uh, protests on the on the rail lines, uh, and this was a a real a huge hot potato for our for our federal politicians. We just, we just had the same thing happen in America. What three years ago? Two Standing Rock. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm aware. Of that. Same story. And that, right. And that's a same exact that's story. A pipe, yeah, that's a pipeline that starts in Canada and hits south. But same, I mean, I'm saying it's the same story. It, it's it Native is, Americans exactly. on their land. That's their nation. That we're like, get the fuck out of here. We we got progress to make. Yeah, right. yeah that, it's that, the same. That's a thing. horrible situation. That's been that's been oh, going well, we had, uh, since the the very beginning, since Manifest Destiny, uh, and uh, basically, you know, the extermination of uh, of the Native people, and then the consolidation of the few that were left standing. Uh, into reservations, uh, and uh, uh, now when we w want to go through these reservations, notwithstanding the treaties and all the rest of the stuff that were negotiated, uh, we're going to do it, all right? Because progress is the number and one. And it has nothing to do with race. Power. That's privilege and power is number one. Well, race, race, race is... It, it has race nothing to do with it. Is, an economic 
outgrowth of economics and it's an outgrowth of the creation of an underclass. And in, in both the United States and Canada, the Native Americans are a, uh, are the they're in the way. They're, they're, they're the underclass and the blacks are the underclass. Uh, and the underclass always is the one that gets the shit. Okay. Uh, and, uh, so I, I, yeah. I, I would, I would, I would pick a bone there with the, There's a difference between black and native American, uh, especially in America. Not that Na- native Americans are native to here. Reason, there's a reason around. that Native Americans stand with uh, the blacks uh, because they ha- their interests, minority, their economic, their economic interests are the same. Okay, uh, they're both they're both being oppressed economically. So, yeah. uh, wow. you know, but that's yes, that's the way the capital capitalism. But, but there are a lot of white people. Uh, yeah, there's there's a white uh, there's I call them it's white economic. Guys. It's, it's uh, a, the the system doesn't care what color you are. There is definitely prejudice going on, especially with you know police and our legal system. Yeah, I, I would not argue with anything what different. You are. There's a big difference between the way police treat the black population and the way they treat the white population. There's totally like go to a place. You go to a place like L.A., where I mean you have. Just like the Los Angeles Police Department have something like eleven hundred uh, black police officers. Yeah, we call them Oreos. Yeah. You know, I figured out some they, stuff they, about they, this. They, oh, they, kind of they this morning, in fact. Okay. And, you know, part part of the whole Black Lives Matter thing. You know, I get in trouble because I want to say all lives matter. And I guess that's not cool anymore. But I say that because it kind of gets into a fundamental Christian principle where thou shall not kill and all that you know and that applies to everybody so uh, but leaving that issue you know aside I, I came to realize a lot of the uh, anger out there is did get something across to me and that in America we have two different attitudes about what the police are I'll idealize thing and, and, and say from a really nice northern village in the 1600s. You had your Burgermeister out there, you know, and he's walking around at night and he's making sure that the whole society is, you know, it, he's much more than just a policeman. But, you know, so, say from the south, who is the policeman? Oh, he's he's catching your ass because you're, you're trying to run away, you know. And that's not maintaining any social order that you want to be a part of. And I really do think, even now, years later, that, say, a black person has, has seen the police in a not-so-healthy way in a certain point of view. Because, you know, if you got a driver's license, you kind of agree to, like, if you're pulled over, keep your hands on your wheel and say, sir, and, you know, not escalate the situation. And I worry, you know, I see that the anger and perception of, say, what black people think police are. And I'm not saying they're wrong from their experience. They're absolutely right. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's a problem. And that's what, what a lot of What about the black this, police, though? How do black police officers, how, how do the black population look at black police? If, if, we, if we could just snap theory. our fingers and but, all the police in what, America were black, would that... They, would, what, no, once once they yeah. put on put on the, the the cop uniform, once they're out there uh, with the head with the headgear and so forth. I mean, you could barely see what color the cop is now because they're wearing so much military gear. Uh, well, I mean, one of the guys that killed Floyd uh, was was Chinese. They'll swing the they'll swing the billy clubs. Yeah. I don't know the white guys. I'm saying one of the guys standing there watching Floyd supposedly you know get choked to death by by chauvin was a chinese guy right I mean, he's I'm, a person of color that, but that's you, what I'm you, saying. You, you, that's what i'm saying you I'm haven't heard saying. anyone say anything about that what color See, well, and what i'm trying to bring up here when i brought up the two different things is a kind of like you got two different kinds of mission statements to the police so you got some of them thinking their whole thing is to is to maintain power maintain order and, and kill if necessary to do that. Where you have, say, another 
attitude where the police are the public servants. They're the ones who respond to accidents. They're the ones who direct power. I mean, direct traffic when power goes out and we'll tie it in. And, uh, you know, and what's going on now is just a lot of anger and people are, you know, like defund them. Oh, you want them to go away so that somebody can break into your house and take all your shit. You know, who, who wants that? No. And that's is not going to make I, I, any. I, I have pointed this out on on many different threads on the diner. You know, you, you, if a civilization requires laws and laws require law enforcement. If you take one of those things away, you don't have civilization. I mean, that, that's well, fact. We, we won't have civilization much longer. I mean, this is we're looking at the collapse of industrial civilization. That's what's up going on right now. And no, uh, I, 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 would, I would. Well, you could argue. I, I mean, I could. I could definitely argue that point. Yeah, I mean, well, of course, we're on the track for for collapse. I mean, that that's just historical fact. Uh, but there are things that are different um now and mostly that that revolves around the fact that we're 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 a globe a truly global economy connected by the internet this is this is uncharted territory in the history of man and add to that add to that artificial intelligence uh, uh, logarithms that run everything i mean we're, we're we're there, and then on top of that, add our effect on on the environment of our planet. And you, you have a soup and you have no idea what the ingredients are. I mean, th- we're, we're talking about com- levels of complexity that we cannot possibly understand. And to think we could understand that is just it's, it's hubris. Uh, so really predicting the future of collapse at this point. There's a there's a, you, you one could make an argument that, that that this really is different this time because of the fact that we have a lot of different elements in play right now. The only <laughs> thing I would argue that you, and I'll I'll finish this line. But the only thing I will argue that we could we could take from the past and apply to our current situation would be resources, right? I mean, a lot of civilizations collapse based on an overshoot uh, of, of resources. You know, they, they, they built like Easter Island, you know, they cut all the trees down, shit collapsed, right? You can apply that to where we're at. But I think that's the only thread, if, if we're going to talk about collapse, that's the only thread that we really could apply to our current situation because humanity at that point, it's unprecedented. It, it's, un, it's unprecedented in our numbers, you know? I mean, yeah, two billion people yeah. when, when JFK was president for the first time in the history of man, we had two billion people and now we're knocking on eight billion and then we're 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 connected virtually instantaneously and our economy for the globe is connected. I mean, you know, I'm just saying prognosticating that this is the collapse and this is when it's going to happen. It's this just too complex part of the collapse. It's not the collapse. OK, it's a manifestation of collapse. All right. Which is sure. social break. OK, that is one of the things. And that is a lesson you can take from history. Uh, slave revolts occurred in Rome uh, when Rome was collapsing. OK, and what is the underclass? They're, they're a form of slaves. Uh, anybody who's, uh, you know, paid a, a extremely low wages can barely make ends meet. Uh, has less than four hundred dollars in the bank, all the rest of that uh, to handle stuff. That and, and you know they're in debt to the banks. Uh, they're slaves. Uh, they're debt slaves. And uh, all slaves. Every, every the system. Person, basically, uh, basically every the bottom fifty percent of our population are slaves. Okay. No, every, more than that. More, yeah, five yeah, yeah, percent minimum. Minimum. The top five percent. If you don't have to, if if you don't have to make money because the amount of money you have makes you enough money to where you don't have to make money, like mm-hmm. that's a whole. If you have to work, you're you're a slave to that system. I mean, that's it's right. money. Yeah, I mean, so how many people don't have to work? You know, we all got to work. Five percent of about five percent of the population, at least in 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 the Western world, about five percent. If we're just speaking about economics, yeah, about five percent, 
If, if you have two and a half million dollars worth of, of of liquid cash, cash, you don't have to work. Yeah, yeah. Million, I think I agree with your definition. Five percent, yeah, five percent return on a million dollars is uh, fifty thousand dollars a year. Now, you know, I live on half that. Okay, so if I had a million dollars in liquid assets that I could invest and so forth, I, I wouldn't have to work, and that's without Social Security. Okay. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, again, uh, look, I have it, a savings it, account I, that I, pays me one percent of the money I have in my savings account. What's one percent of a million dollars? It's ten thousand. Ten thousand. Uh, what do you call it? OK, it, uh, oh, a million dollars on this. It's, it's called a high earning savings account that I have in my local bank. Yeah, But you're, right? you're, if you had a million, million dollars, if you had a million dollars, Lucid, you would not put it into a, a savings account. I'm you saying you could put that into a savings account, and then you would get ten thousand dollars a month. No, a year. Oh, a year. Okay. But that's what I'm saying. Actually, if you had that much, you'd get better interest. So you'd probably get like twenty, two point seven percent. So you yeah. get well, almost fifty thousand. You wouldn't have to work, and that's just a million dollars in liquid money. That's right. right. That's that's but that's. You got to work to get it. <laughs> all, you need, all you need is around a million dollars and you don't have to work. I mean, as long right. as you're not, you know, trying to live in, you know, several houses and have lots of cars and uh, stuff, toys, uh, you know, you can but live in got a family. Now you right. got to have a million dollars for each one of them. No. Right. No. Well, how many, how many, well, how much you need for a wife? I mean, uh, is she only going to need like half a million for it? You know, I, uh, you give me, you give me a million dollars, and I promise you, I won't work another day in my life. And I got a wife and two kids. Yeah, and I'll uh, pay taxes. I'll pay taxes every year too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so you won't like, have to pay taxes. I, I could live. <laughs> I could live. You know, without Social Security, on uh, you know, five hundred thousand dollars in assets. Uh, with you know, so. Uh, the point the point here is that most people don't have that, okay? Uh, and uh -huh. if you want to quote the number as five percent of the population does have that much, uh, whatever. Uh, but everybody else is a slave to the system. And then there's degrees of slavery, all right? Just like there were degrees in you know the old South. Uh, you have your overseers who were slaves uh, in many uh, instances, and they kind of you know, rise up in the ranks and, and they uh, uh, do the job of overseeing the, uh, the other slaves, the lower slaves. And uh, and you see that in, in our uh, system as well. You have overseers and these are people that are very well paid uh, uh, in, in our society, uh, doctors, lawyers, CPAs uh, and so forth. They're like the overseers of, of the whole well, system. Let, let, and, let me and, ask well, you a question. Well paid, but they're well paid slaves. Uh, I, I want to ask a question. Uh, Cam. It's Cam, right? Mm hmm. What do you think? Uh, well, I think the other side that we're not talking about too much is um, it really depends how much you need, like how much money you need to actually live a fulfilling life. And actually, before I learned about collapse and everything like that, I was kind of into the uh, early retirement stuff. Like Mr. Money Mustache, uh, your money or your life. Like there's a few things like that. It's basically just reducing, uh, reducing your expenses down to like a much lower level than average, um, and actually focusing on what brings real fulfillment. Not getting a new car, not getting a big house, but spending time with family, getting to know your neighbors, and while stuff now that I think about it is really helpful in collapse too, uh, because um, when well, when you're retired, so to speak like early retirement, uh, you have a lot more time to learn more skills, uh, like learn music or learn welding like I am. I'm not retired, but, but you know what I mean? Like you can learn useful skills like that. So I think, yeah, yeah. The other side that a lot of people don't look at uh, is expenses. So I think even on a fairly average salary, if you really shrink down your needs, like especially for energy too, that's another good thing for saving money and also for collapse in the future. If you can shrink your energy needs, um, that's, that's, uh, it's really helpful all around because it's, it's good, good for the planet. As some people like to say, it's, uh, 
good for you economically and then also good because further in the future when things get more fragile and more uh, unreliable then you'll be better prepared for it so yeah that's my take right. on it oh yeah. he's got a pipe well now. said thank you yeah 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 uh you should wait. consider growing bamboo that's all i'm saying you know, actually, before you mentioned, uh, or before Irv mentioned growing it, I thought that was only like a tropical thing. So that's, I think I might try that well, in my garden next year. You, well, actually, you guys can grow clumping bamboo, which is uh, non-invasive. Oh. Well, we really can't grow that in the United States. Uh, uh, there are some places you can, but, uh, you know, 95 degrees to 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for a couple of days will kill it. Because it's uh most of it comes from like the Himalayas, so it's it's adapted to very cold weather, and it doesn't spread. It it grows yeah. like a shrub, basically. It just grows. Cool. Uh, tropical tropical it's bamboo is the same. Try to get that variety. Uh, well, it's 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 the it's it's about the rhizome, the uh, pachymorphic rhizome systems. So they don't like they don't spread through the ground. They just kind of grow up like that instead of like spreading out like leptomorphic bamboo systems, which are temperate invasive species, essentially. Uh, but yeah. sorry to. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. We've drifted. I'll, 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 I, I, hey, look, I can take any angle and tie it down back into bamboo. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, you'll always turn it around into bamboo. Uh, I, I, hey, it, it's the answer to humanity. I mean, you know, you know this, all our this, problems. This video is going to get chopped up into yeah. a, a bunch of short segments. Uh, I'm not going to sub try to subject people to this entire video. <laughs> uh, so, so what you're saying is you're going to chop all the bamboo bits out? I'm not even trying anymore to direct direct us and go into the topics that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and I'm just letting it go where, wherever it goes, okay? Well, that's uh, how you got to do it, man. We've been on race, we've been on bamboo, we've been on electricity, uh, we've been on uh, Native Americans, uh, you know, we're running through the gamut. Race, we've been, we've, been, we've been to the Middle East, yeah, we've been to uh, manifestations well, wait. of wait. <laughs> all, all sorts of stuff. Let me ask you one more question. No, okay. What do you think, Irv? What do I think? About what? Yes. About what? Oh, Which one of those topics? <laughs> I what are you just talk talking about? What do you think about what are you was just talking about? What what was Re talking about? I was talking uh, about me. I was talking about the gamut of of topics. This, yeah, we, yeah. Well, we sure we sure oh. touched on a lot of stuff today, and that's good. You know, there's a lot of a lot of things going on in the world, and uh, we've touched on a bunch of them. So I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, it, 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 our focus on the diner is not permaculture. It's not race. It's not uh, what do you call it? The climate. Uh, it's not overpopulation. Even what the focus is is collapse, and all of those are parts of collapse uh, aspects of it that we are confronted, and some of them. We have some control over. You have some control uh, over uh, producing local electricity uh, in some ways. Some are more uh, easy, easier than others to do. You know, uh, just having a generator. Okay, if you don't have a generator uh, for short interruptions of power, you know, on the order of say a day or less. Uh, and actually with a Jenny, you know, if you keep a supply of gas, you're good for a month. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you don't at least have that, then you're just, you know, you're a Darwin award winner. Okay. You're going to be one of the first people to go because you're not thinking ahead. And, uh, and you know, the same with food sources. Uh, you know, if, if you go to the food store, you know, three times a week because the refrigerator is empty all the time and you don't have backup food that can last you uh, in some situations that are easily envisioned, then another Darwin Award goes to you, right? And, 
and so forth and so on. Those are things that you do have some control over. You don't have control over what is going on in race relations right now. Uh, that is a social phenomenon that is much larger than any one person can have an effect on. Uh, and, uh, you know, the best thing to do with that is stay out of the way if you can. Uh, and I am as out of the way as you get uh, here on the last great frontier, we'll ask. Uh, but, you know, most of you live in a city or close to a city, uh, lower 48, and, uh, you know, and then in, in our European uh, viewers, they uh, live in similar types of situations. Actually, I think the Europe overall is even more densely populated than the fascist states of America are. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, also have, uh, you know, they imported a, a very large number of people from the black communities in Africa, uh, not slaving them, uh, in, in, in the traditional sense, but e economic slavery to do the scut work in their society over the last 50 years. Uh, and so the populations of those folks have vastly expanded and they're the same people that are unhappy over there as are unhappy over here. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have any uh, control over that. And, uh, you know, you can observe it and you can decry it and you can say, you know, oh, are, we're all going crazy. We're not going crazy. This is how it goes. Everybody knows. On that note, uh, I got to finish okay. cooking dinner. Yes, I was just doing my closing. Okay. That's all to do. Oh, my bad. This time, until next time, here on the Collapse Cafe of the Doomstead Diner. Hasta la... Oops.